So Dan, thank you so much for uh, chatting with us. We're here at the Atlas booth, which is one of my favorite booths, and great I know you, you it's so great to see Thanks you too. So we talked at an SOC event uh, in LA, and I asked you a question that I, I prefaced with, I'm not sure you'll want to answer this. And then you gave me just the best answer, and I'm like, I want to get that on film. And I said, if you could start with the Mercuries, would you ever build the Orions? And do the Mercuries make the Orions obsolete? So do you remember what you told me? I will paraphrase if I can. I don't remember exactly what I said, but uh, I think what I said was we wouldn't have been able to build the Mercury lenses if we hadn't built the Orion lenses because everything that we do is a process of learning. And so yeah. it would have been impossible to jump right to building a Mercury lens if we hadn't built the Orions. Um, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from a uh, learning and development standpoint. So the secret of Atlas Lensco is our philosophy, uh, the philosophy that drives what we do in terms of our product roadmap, our thinking, our interaction, the way that we work as a team, the way that we work with the world outside. We care about cinematography, we care about users because we are users, we're filmmakers, uh, cinematographer uh, for over 20 years now, and I've just been fortunate enough to learn from the best, but what I try to do is apply life learning to what we do in terms of building the lenses, and so the Orions were within grasp of something we imagined, we built prototypes, we built three prototypes first, all 65 millimeter focal length and then showed them to people and said, is this something you actually like? Because um, I like them, Boris liked them. We didn't know if the world at large would like the lenses, but I really wanted a set of anamorphic lenses that embodied everything that we managed to do with the Orions. Right. And um, everything that we did with the Orions taught us how to make a different lens, which is what became Mercury. Right. Um, and, and I will say, I think, now it's easy to, to, to forget about where you, from where you started. This is an, was an unproven space. I was talking to Trito uh, the other day about all of these other anamorphics coming from some of these companies. And one, he, yeah, and he said something really interesting. He was like, yeah, I was really impressed with their, these lenses. Uh, they'll get a piece of the pie. And, my, and I was like, and it's a growing pie. And it's a pie, I, I kind of feel like it's a pie that Atlas baked, and it, it didn't exist five, like when you got into the space, there was no absolute reason to be super confident that this was something that the market, that it would be a huge market for, but it turns out there's a market enough that other people have jumped in. I think that's pretty cool. And you're also I, maybe the only booth that's actually grown in size from last year to this year, a lot of, because the, the, the costs of the booths have gotten more expensive, a lot of people have downsized, including some of these really big companies. So congratulations on that success. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Going back to the philosophy, yeah. one of the things, uh, you know, in that space, especially, well, with lenses in general, but especially with anamorphics, uh, the choice of how you you give it character matters a lot. You know, Ari chooses to go with a very clean, neutral look, and you're never gonna get fired for choosing an Ari Master Prime, but you're never gonna get, and I don't mean to say I would, I love the Ari look, but you're never gonna get, get an article about the genius of you choosing an Ari Master Prime either. You know, it's just, you're starting from like this perfect clean image. You guys get to choose, and I think this is one of the most exciting things about, um, the lens space itself is when you choose character for your lens, you're also in a way choosing character and feels for whole movies. You said you were really influenced, um, uh, well, for some things by like the look of, um, of Punch Drunk Love. Uh, what is that like in terms of when you in the shop and, this, and, and making those kinds of decisions and, and, and t well, tell me more about the thinking. Really and. This is a great question in general, like, for Atlas, the key driving question is why, right? Always start with why. So why do we like anamorphic lenses? We like anamorphic lenses because a lot of the films that we watched growing up were filmed on anamorphic lenses. But why were those, lens why were those movies filmed with those lenses? And for me, uh, Punch Drunk Love, Photographed by Robert Ellswood, ASC, directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, starring Thomas, or starring Adam Sandler. Um, 
for me that was an awakening film where I'm watching it and I go, why does this movie look this way? So it's the beginning, of go, going back to why. Right. right. So we're watching this movie and when the lens is a character in this movie, it's part of the storytelling, but why? So I dug down the rabbit hole and found out, okay, they use Panavision C-series lenses. And then many of my favorite films growing up were filmed with Panavision right. C-series or B-series auto cannon bars. But why were those lenses made? Why do these exist at all? So I went down that rabbit hole. And really, if you want to dig down to the bottom of it, there's three spheres of influence. There's commerce, business, uh, technology. Our, our art form is an inherently technical art form. It requires technology. Even if we were telling stories in a cave, fire is a technology, right? So yeah. we're, we're casting shadows on the wall and telling stories with shadows. Did Later you know? Cave, that's technology. This is a and detour. That's the human, uh, the human implementation, right? So what, yeah. we, what we create as creative storytellers or what we pass as human knowledge from one human or generation of humans to another yeah. uh, is a huge part of that storytelling. So uh, go ahead. You oh, say. You, may, you said th about cave paintings. This is a total detour and I don't even care. Um, it's my channel. Um, I'm going to do what I want. These um, uh, cave, they found, someone figured out that a lot of the cave paintings where you see animals with like double heads and people that are sort of doubled, it's because when, when you were in that cave, those are animations, they're not still photos, because the wow. flickering of the firelight would give you this, you know, they, the because reason those have, would cast yeah, shadows. and they'd have the doubling, isn't mind that cool? Mind blown, mind blown. Ooh. I've had a lot of mind blowing uh, discussions and experiences at this show, actually, believe it or not. Like, that's the best thing about being back right. at an AV show, connecting with people in the community that I don't get to see every day or every week, but gather here for this kind of event. It's a big human event. But uh, I was reminded, speaking with Roy Wagner ASC yesterday, he told me, uh, filmmaking is dangerous. Why? Because, well, it's like making a product. I make products like I make films. We start with an idea, and that's your script, right? That's your outline. But you get the set, and you start the process, and then things change. And if you're not able to change and adapt on a film set, you'll never get the film made. And the same is true of making a product. You start with a roadmap and a, a blueprint of what you want to do, and you learn along the way, and that's that's the process of developing. So every take is a prototype for the perfect take on a film. And every step in the product making process is a step towards the better product. Um, and you know, that's kind of like human evolution or like evolution of our thought process. Right. Um, but coming back to uh, what Mr. Wagner said, he said, it's a risk. You're taking a risk, right? So in the days of film, you'd only have, at most, nine minutes on a magazine of film. Right. right. So you wouldn't have people coming in and changing hair and makeup during a take while the camera's rolling because once you run that film mag out, you're out. And sometimes, depending on the director, depending on the budget, again, coming back to the commerce technology, honestly, yeah. right? Commerce, we're going to run out of film. We're not going to be able to make our day. So they were more prudent with the choices that they made. And sometimes the director wouldn't do more than one take. So you'd have to, as an actor, you'd have to show up and give your best performance on the first performance. Right. Uh, as a lighting person, you'd have to make sure that it's lit the way the DP needs it. And as a sound person, you'd want to make sure the boom's in the right place. I mean, I think if anybody saw Babylon, the whole scene where they introduce sound and they're trying to get the sound right. Yeah. That says it all, right? I, I don't know if that movie was for anyone other than filmmakers. But I it was very film, much for filmmakers. But it, it was really, yeah, it's for filmmakers. Yeah, too. yeah. Um, but it's just sort of, it reminded me, yes, there's a huge amount of risk in what we do, but if you show up, you're bound to be rewarded one way or another. And so that's been kind of a, a, a reminder of just how fragile and precious life is and how fragile and precious our opportunities are. So take a risk is what I'd encourage people to do. Um, don't take a blind risk, although sometimes I do. Um, <laughs> well, they've been working out. Don't, don't be too calculated. Use your yeah. instinct. You know, that's a yeah. very human thing. Use your instinct. Listen to your heart, but also look with your eyes, look and listen around. He, he mentioned that Ansel Adams, who was his teacher in photography, said, OK, take one photo, right? OK, you get to take one photo. Now, put your camera down. Now, without picking up the camera, look around you and observe a hundred different compositions. Yeah. And you're looking around, 
I mean, that's how I that's how I became a DP. Is I grew up yeah. looking at light coming in through the window of my house. And, I, oh, I used really interesting. I used to shoot a Pentax 67, and it's just a giant brick. And you, and if you're shooting 220, you've got 20 20 shots max. I'm, and if 120, you've got 12, and then you've got to reload. And yeah, it teach it taught me so much about how to think through. And yeah, that that's that's something we're definitely spoiled today. But now I do want to get back to. This is the ethos that pervades Atlas, and it really and and the fact that that ends up showing up in the lenses. And I would say, you know, one of the things I think is most exciting here is while we have all this incredible digital technology democratizing filmmaking, you've come from another direction, leaned into that, and then provided a catalyst for a whole other way of making a look and making making films, so that they will. So that they have character. Um, do you want to talk a, a bit about the character in Absolutely. the uh, so, and the character choices in the Mercury's? I mean, every lens design is a compromise. So um, just like every film is a series of compromises, but every lens design is a compromise. There's no such right. thing as a perfect lens. Uh, but what we try to do is embrace the kind of perfections that we like or that have inspired us along the way. And there's different levels of imperfection, different qualities that exist between a Mercury series and an Orion series lens. And we lean into, uh, if anybody, what I like to say is, if you hated Orion series lenses, <laughs> you might love a Mercury series lens. If you loved an Orion series lens, you may also love a Mercury series <laughs> lens. So, we didn't do 180 degrees opposite. We took all the really good qualities that we developed in the Orion and nuanced things in a slightly different direction. So it's polarizing, um, but these have a lot of barrel distortion for a 1.5 times anamorphic lens. But we wanted to embrace that barrel distortion as part of the architecture. So these have a patent pending optical architecture that is unlike any other anamorphic lens. So in a way, this is maybe one of the most exciting design things that's happening in anamorphic movies in the last 70 years. Uh, so that's a big deal to me and to the team. Uh, huge shout out Scott DeWald, huge shout out Roy Schultz, my co-founder. Uh, between them, you know, I, I, I set a bar of challenge for them to try to accomplish something really crazy. And they didn't just meet the bar, they exceeded the bar by reaching even further. Yeah. But what we try to do with these is have very low chromatic aberration high level of barrel distortion, uh, minimal breathing, but a unique breathing style that's empowered by the architecture that we've designed. And there are some really clever choices that allowed us to get these as small as they are, and uh, they fit PL mounts, so they're made to go on film cameras or digital cameras. And the 1.5 squeeze is made for traditionally more modern film sensor aspects of a 16 by 9 sensor but it also looks great on 4x3 film or even on uh, 1.8, 1.85, uh, 3 per film. So you get a variety of aspect ratios you can deliver by having 1.5 yeah. times anamorphic. And instead of trying to make the perfect lens, we're trying to make the perfectly imperfect lens. Uh, so right. it's a really good close focus, which is something I need and want as a camera person when I'm filming. They have golden uh, amber street flares instead of the blue flares, which you traditionally see with like a Panavision C series. I like uh, the warmth like, of these. I like them both, honestly, because like Punch Drunk Love is all blue flares. Yeah, it is. The magnesium chloride coatings on those Panavision C series. And there's a ton of barrel distortion in that. I love that movie. <laughs> and so this is like an alternate reality version of that lens. Um, and you know, it's, it's crazy because if the world was the way that it is now with a level of accessible lens options and I hadn't started this company I don't know if I would have started the company so right if seven years ago this many options were in the marketplace I, if we are if this company existed outside of me I wouldn't have started a lens company because I wouldn't have said oh, that, I'm that, that being said I think it is definitely the case that a lot of those options are an outgrowth of people recognizing the demand from what Atlas established and set in the marketplace. So it, it, there's no, there's no, th that egg doesn't exist without this chicken first, right? That's a, that's a great point, exactly. You know. Yes, it's a, it's a chicken and egg uh, paradigm for sure. 
But uh, if anybody out there saw our uh, April 1st product launch, oh my God, the Alice Serious <laughs> series lenses, then you know we're dabbling with experimenting with all kinds of toys. We actually built those lenses. They're here. Uh, I could grab one out of the case and show you. We could put it on the camera. But as we like to say, it's for your artisanal aspect ratio needs. The first one by anamorphic lens. So, you know, we took it, a Orion series lens set and then took all the anamorphic elements out and then recalibrated the lenses so that they would actually focus and function. Um, how much, so that was maybe my favorite April Full stroke this year, but how much work was that to, uh, because you put a ton into the, the launch video too. Well, that's a huge, he's doing a huge part to uh, Rick Dard and to our team. <laughs> so first of all, we started by saying, uh, about a, a month before April Fool's Day, we said, well, you know, what would happen if we took the anamorphic elements out of an Orion series? So we have a tremendous team of uh, technicians that build the lenses in Glendale. So, well, you know, we're going to have you undo some of your work here and take some of the anamorphic elements out of the lenses you've already built and calibrated. And that took us about a week to, uh -huh. to take a set and get them calibrated without the anamorphic group in. And uh, people are looking at me like, why are we doing this? Like, you're crazy, but they're also willing to take the risk, right? So like, well, you know, in a way, if we're taking a film set paradigm, you're the director, so we're gonna listen to what you say even if we think you're crazy, which they did, they all did. Um, but we made cool lenses. They looked kind of like a vintage ball car, or some of them look a little bit, I don't want to compare them to a real 35, that's, but other people will say, hey, they look kind of like a K35. I don't know if I see it, but you you all be the judge. You let me know. But, I, I, I think there's also, this is a funny story, but it also actually speaks to the fact that you've got your engineering in-house and you have a really direct connection to them. It, 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 or not even like it's another department, but you are interfacing with them constantly yeah, at, a, at a deep level. We're a very tight and, and we did not plan this part of the conversation. I just realized that it's talking okay. to you now. We have such a tight-knit uh, group. It's kind of like a family or it's more like a band. So, you know, sometimes you jam and sometimes you you play the songs you know, right? So when you're lucky, you get in a jam session and you're like, okay, let's let's figure this out. Let's try some things that we haven't tried before. And that can lead to interesting places or it could just be a total noodle fest and you don't get anywhere. But that's part of the process <laughs> as creatives and yeah. technicians and engineers. So um, just really grateful for our team. And then super huge thanks to Rick Darge and Vinny Balbo. Uh, and our team who are all in the, the series, series launch film. But Rick Darge put that together in about a week worth of time. Mm -hmm. uh, huge thanks to Rodney Charters, huge thanks to Clementine, everyone who's in the, the launch film. Really grateful to you. And uh, thanks for having fun with us. It was, it's, it was a pleasure. Yeah. And um, I think the point you're trying to get back to is um, it's nice to have a team that works so tight knit. Yeah. Right? That's true. Yeah. Um, and is there anything you want to tease before we let you go? Well, I have a question. I have, I have two questions, actually, yeah. before we go. Ah, okay. So, uh, question one, are you Team Boca or Team Bokeh? Team Bokeh. Team Bokeh, okay. Okay, Bokeh. I am. Uh, I, I'll be honest, I waffle, so. Uh, I, I was Team... Actually, it depends on what day, if I've had enough sleep, <laughs> how much coffee I've had, or if I had a few drinks the night before. I, I think I, I was. I ramble with it. Because I think it, it comes from, is it the Korean or the Japanese? It's Japanese, Japanese word, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and, and we didn't really use it un, until fairly recently, linguistically, in this industry. So I, I, would, I feel like we can respect uh, the, the origins. I can be a bit of, a, of a, a, a grammar snob sometimes. I like that. It's a very divisive uh, topic, which is why I brought it up, because I, I love to hear people. So, but then you said you waffle. If I, if I have to, to, to pin you down on it, Team Boca or Team Bokeh? Well, I like to be fancy, so I, sometimes. Sometimes <laughs> I'm a little rough, sometimes I'm a little fancy. It's I, kind of funny, like the Michelin star restaurant. I find myself saying Boca more times than Bokeh, but okay. I like saying Bokeh. So I push myself to say bouquet. You're like, but I don't want to say like bouquet or bouquet. Right. It's bouquet. Okay. You're, you're like okay. the guy who's like, oh yeah, I go to Michelin starred restaurants, but I get Michelin tires, even though it's the same company that there makes the guide. And I think the O is probably the hidden part of the word, like the the bo, 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 bo. Like you can have a long O or a short O. I think that's the mi the missing part in English. Uh, 
uh, language, like you could have like a bo or a bo, bo, bo okay, bo okay. This okay. is the, to the to the audience out there. This is the secret uh, at NAB. Is if the if the interview goes long enough, we just go off the rails into an all new territory. Uh, Dan, thank you. One more question. Oh yes. Actually. I'm sorry, my bad. No, it's um, it's our channel. We can do it now, so unedited. If I was to offer you a free Orion on the show floor right now, what would you say? I know where this is going, but offer him, offer him one. Michael, can I offer? Look you at a, his eyes. Can I offer you a free Orion on the show right now? He's okay. got very big eyes right now. <laughs> Orion. <laughs> One for you, Jazz. <clears throat> Cheers. Orion. Oh, Orion. Oh, Ryan. <laughs> for your happy time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really Always appreciate it. Um, if you're in Glendale, California, or anywhere in the Los Angeles area on a Wednesday, stop by for Wednesday, Wednesday at Atlas Lens Co. We're at 6933 San Fernando Road. Every Tuesday, we do an interactive live stream where we will show you the lenses you want to see through the professional camera you want to see whether it's a mirrorless camera. We don't have an HD tab for a 435, so I can't show you that yet. But we'll show you any modern cinema camera with an HD tab and uh, any mirrorless camera you want to see with any lens. Uh, and interact with you, answer your questions through the live stream on Instagram Live and YouTube Live simultaneously. So huge shout out, thanks for coming by. Uh, stay well and have a great week. Thank you so much, I really Cheers, appreciate man. it. That was awesome.